Welcome to the Own It Powercast, the place to be when you get serious about making big changes and accelerating growth in your life and in your relationships. Finally create the life you've always wanted, living life on your own terms. Learn how to take your fear and turn it into powerful choices that will create sustained change. Now your host, Mary Baker. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Own It Powercast a place where you can come to get what you need to move yourself forward. Hey, it's Mary Baker, and welcome to episode 148. Creating change means starting with boundaries. So welcome back this month, which is all about getting moving towards what we want to change in our life. And last week, we dove into how we can get in our own way with our faulty beliefs about what is possible and what isn't, and fear-based perfectionism and other things. Today, I want to focus on the opposite of all that and essentially how important boundaries are if we want to change things in our life, especially our internal boundaries or self-discipline. Because if we want to start saying yes to doing things differently, then I think we must learn to have a stronger no to what is no longer working for us and probably holding us back. In essence, we're going to talk today about looking at how to set and honor boundaries with yourself. Boundaries are an important aspect that you hear me talk about all the time, and I don't think we can make any change in our life until we start with where we end and others begin, and what we say yes to and what we say no to. Because if you leave it wide open and vague, you're probably going to stay right where you are. That's what we've been doing. The biggest thing to understand about change is change takes courage. You know, boundaries are all about doing the right thing and letting go of the outcome. That means letting go of control, letting go of what can happen, having faith in the process, believing that you're going to be okay no matter what, even if it doesn't go exactly how you plan, and that good things are in store when you begin to do the next healthy thing. Be that with your body or your mind or career or anything. Now, some of that we already know because we see other people, I don't know, get healthier, save their money, get organized, work on connecting more, asking for promotion, going back to school. And we can see some of the cause and effect in their life. And we can see the aggregate of that for enough people, let's say. Eating healthier seems to be a good thing. And here are the reasons why it's good. So that will factor in, of course, into our choice of changing something. And that's good because that is evidence. And as we've talked about, your subconscious loves experiential data. So watching someone else experience something can be reassuring, I think, and can help give you courage to get through the fear because your why it is a good thing is already there. All right. So boundary work is courageous because it also means embracing your emotions. You know, when you're not busy denying reality, When you're not busy staying too busy, doing, running around, focusing on everyone else's needs, you got to let go of control. You got to let go of the numbing out. Because when you remove the drug of that fear-driven, well, drive, you might have to feel. I know that sounds logical, but that can actually be overwhelming for those of you who have spent a lot of years running from who you are, running from what you really feel, And running from grief, essentially. You know, running from the grief that maybe your family can't support what is good for you. Maybe things are really going to have to change and you're not ready to open that can. Maybe grief in ways that maybe you've let yourself down. You know, making friends with reality means making friends with cause and effect. For example, others may get frustrated and you may just keep changing. Life will keep changing and opening up for you. Embracing the fears and the feelings around that. And there could be a bunch of mixed feelings too. You could be so excited and proud of yourself for finally running that marathon. And also sad and upset because your partner feels threatened by your health and your growth and your new running friends. Being open to this and embracing the bigger picture of change and growth for us is important. 
anticipating what you might run into emotionally and sit with what you do and find a few people who can help you sit with that or find a coach or a therapist that can help you sit with that and feel the feelings and let them go. Creating change means setting limits out there and inside. Outside meaning saying no graciously to other people's requests or their needs unless you've already decided that you will honor that. Like you're a parent and of course you're going to feed your kids. But maybe you're trying to lose weight. So you, even if they want to eat carry out all the time, you may say no for lots of reasons, including your own work on your eating. It's a needs versus wants kind of thing. So saying no to others graciously, not acting out, not lashing out, not reacting. What we want to focus on today is setting limits with yourself. What I mean by that is saying no to what is no longer good for you. Like it may have been a coping skill that got you here and that's fine. Maybe you stuffed your feelings and ate carbs. Well, that was better maybe than drinking or using or hurting yourself. But it's no longer working for you because now you're older and it's catching up with your health and you want to look and feel better. Setting limits means limiting the amount of things, perhaps. Like we're going to talk about in a moment. Saying no to fear-based compulsion, the running we just talked about, compulsive eating, scrolling, chatting, TV binging. Saying no to these things or limiting them can help allow for the good things to happen, like time for a walk, more rest, better health, less anxiety, lower blood pressure, less self-loathing, more confidence. So internal boundaries, self-discipline, means setting an internal structure for ourselves. If you feel overwhelmed and don't know where to start, you are not alone. Because here's the deal. If this wasn't a problem for you, it wouldn't be a problem for you. You'd already be doing it. I think the whens, the hows, and the whys are the way I like to look at it. And I think they're there to help you out. What do I mean by that? Well, in essence, let's say saying when you will do things can ensure that you're going to get them done. You don't just put them on a never ending to do list. You put them on the calendar to do Tuesday at 4 p.m. You put boundaries around the time and energy and space and resources to actually make that happen. Again, we just talked a few moments ago about making friends with reality and cause and effect. This is a part of that. And the reality testing here is, if I don't schedule it this week, it may not get done because I'm really busy. I don't have lots of hours, let's say this week to get X, Y, and Z done. I'm going to have to schedule it. It also sets up a commitment. It's not vague because we can be really great in being vague and saying, yeah, I really love to do that. It's one thing to say you'd love to do something. It's a whole nother deal to actually do it and make it real. So that's the when. When are you going to do it? What is most reasonable? This is not about controlling outcomes. It's about allowing for reality. When is it most reasonable and possible? And what is the deadline too? You know, sometimes the self-discipline involves getting somewhere on time and doing something on time. Then here comes the how, like saying how you're going to exercise will really help ensure that it's going to be possible to do it. Like maybe you grab a gym membership or a walking buddy or an exercise class or set aside how you're going to go running. Saying how much is a big deal. It means you're setting parameters for how much, let's say you're going to eat, how much you're going to spend in a given month or how much time you'll spend doing something. Time and energy are boundaries. Maybe saying why. You hear me talk about your why all the time because I think it matters. It's a big motivator. You're saying why is very important, I think, to keep you focused, keep you motivated, and to remind you why you want to back away from the donuts and nobody gets hurt. If we don't have our why, then why do it? And I think our why and reminding ourselves of our why can help quell the anxiety of actually changing 
or committing to change? Because what if ambivalence kicks in or it starts getting frustrating or it starts to be a pain in the ass to find time to exercise this month? Getting back to your why is going to help you to find ways, quote unquote, to find time to exercise because you don't want to let it go. You're like, no, this is my health. I've got to get healthier. I need to. I want to be there for my grandkids. I don't want diabetes. There is your why. And it's a, oh, yeah, that's right kind of moment. Keeping your whens, your whys, and your hows top of mind, writing them down the list that you can see every day might help you get back on track if you meander, because we're going to meander, guys. Shit's going to happen. We're going to lose motivation here and there. And I think reminding us of whens and whys and hows is a great non-shaming way to stay committed and get recommitted. And I also think they create possibility and structure at the same time. They tell you when and how you're going to do something. They get you passionate again when you think about your why. And that gives you hope that you can actually do it. When it's wide open, it can feel really overwhelming and not something we can grasp. When we make it more concrete and get down to brass tacks, it makes it real and real builds hope. So here are some examples of using your whens and your whys and your hows and your how muches to set boundaries with yourself. These are just some, I want you to think of some of your own as you hear these. A typical one is sticking to a financial budget every month. Maybe not perfectly, but good enough. That allows for your why. Maybe you want to save money. Maybe you want to save for a vacation. Maybe you've been stressed out because you don't have enough of an emergency fund or you can't pay your bills on time. Having boundaries around what you're going to drink and eat. Not shaming yourself, not getting into perfect or horrible, but maybe some loving parameters, right? You're going to try to eat healthier this week. Maybe you limit yourself to an hour or two of television a day. Maybe you try to practice no gossiping or triangulation in your relationships. Trying to keep the focus on you. Maybe not working past a certain time if you can do that in your job to allow for time for yourself after hours, which includes maybe not answering phone calls or texts after hours unless you're on call or you have to. Only buying what's on your shopping list, that can be hard. Following through on things and even the little things pile up here, guys. Those of you who have a hard time not procrastinating, not letting things go, and can't pull the trigger on following through, start following through on something that you know you can, like you're definitely going to do that. And get consistent on that. Make it a habit before you move on to the next one. Don't try to follow through on everything if you're not already good at that because you're going to blow it up. And then you're going to shame yourself and not feel like you can do it. Keeping a regular routine for morning and evening can really help you get things done, feel glued together, make sure you don't feel crazy on the inside, and that you build confidence. Making time to check in on your week, quadrant two time. Doing laundry every Friday. Not allowing toxic people back in your inner circle. When they're out, they're out. They got to earn their way back in. And that's through a lot of therapy and a lot of change. Maybe telling yourself you don't want to spend more than five minutes on your phone at a time so you don't get sucked in. Maybe building in self-care every month, like your doctor's visits, your downtime, your meditation time, maybe going for a massage, hot bath, things like that. So those are some concrete examples of how to put the whens and the hows and the whys and the how tos and the how muches into place. Break it down, make it real. Start with the concept, but then I want you to say, how am I going to make that happen? When and why? Okay, let's talk about why it's hard for us sometimes to have self-discipline and to keep that. One of them is unearned guilt. This is so important. 
detachment, of course, is key here. You know, what's yours and what belongs to other people. You are not responsible for other people's feelings. I know you know that intellectually. I'm not being condescending. I'm talking to your heart. You are not responsible for their feelings, their needs, their choices, and they're not responsible for yours. You know, like if other people are using passive aggressive behavior, when you graciously say, no, I'm sorry, I can't help you this weekend, then they have no respect for you or your boundaries and they're acting out. They're trying to get you to change your boundaries and to cave and give in and do what they want. It's very emotionally immature. It is very common. Called unearned guilt. You didn't do anything to earn it. Just because your brother wants you to come over this weekend and hang out doesn't mean you have time because you really committed to yourself to clean out the house or take care of the yard or to have some downtime and just take care of you. So the unearned guilt can get in the way of us saying no and keeping our promises to ourselves. I want you to pay attention to if and when you quietly subvert what you were going to do tonight because someone else pops up and says, hey, can you help me do this? Or let's go do this tonight. Or someone calls you and wants to talk for an hour. Or your neighbor stops by. Was that what you wanted to do tonight? Not that we should not be spontaneous. I think it's wonderful. We can have the best conversations when they aren't planned. And those moments with neighbors and friends and brothers are so important. But we have to balance that against what we need for ourselves. Own your choices. Don't do it because someone else wants you to do something. Don't do the because of them you. Own what you want to change. Make it and keep it about you. The data can come from someone else. It can come from your doctor. It can come from your partner. It can come from your colleague or your sister. But then take it in and say, why Why is that true for me? Why is she right? Yeah, that's right. I, I am late all the time. Let me work on that. I don't want to be late. I don't want to disrespect people's time. I hate feeling so stressed out when I do that. I don't like me very much when I do that. Keep it about you and keep it emotionally honest. And look and make sure fear isn't driving you to make these choices. Get some choice statements going. Like even if you're afraid because the doctor said, hey man, you really need to lose some weight because I'm worried about your health. Okay, you take that data in, but then you decide, I want to be healthier. Take ownership of that. We try to change for someone else. It is not sustainable. Trust me, I deal with that all the time when I work with relationships. It usually falls apart after a couple weeks. So our brain can make it hard for us to stick to our boundaries too. So we want to work with it to make sure we can do this. You know, our brains are going to easily regress back to old habits, especially when obstacles arise and create fear getting that fight or flight. I think especially early on when you're trying to forge a new habit, you know, you're kind of fragile in a way, and this is new, and you're not really sure, is this the right thing to do, that kind of thing, as opposed to something you've been doing for months, it's a no-brainer to get back on track. Even when under stress you regress or you're out for a week because you're sick or that kind of thing. So what you do is you just focus on building the habit. That's the piece you can control. If you historically have had a hard time with internal boundaries or self-discipline, it's probably not your fault. We've spoken about this before. I mean, your parents probably didn't have them to model them for you. So where were you going to learn that? Maybe they were often anxious or chaotic, reactionary in their life, putting out fires. Maybe you witnessed them allowing the outside, like people, events, or other people's choices to dictate what they did, as opposed to parents at the dinner table talking in a healthy way about being very intentional about what they want to do this weekend, let's say, or why they're focusing on their health, or why the family is tightening the financial belt. 
So they didn't have them to model them for you. So probably and or their boundaries were either reactionary, like when you got in trouble, then you had to clean your room kind of thing, or too strict. Maybe their boundaries were way too ridiculous. And so you didn't trust them if they weren't consistent. And you didn't trust your parents for that matter. That's a whole nother episode. But you probably rebelled. And guess what? You still may be revenging today at your age. Doing the, oh, I'll show you. I'll do whatever the hell I want. Instead of maturely choosing for yourself. Now, we probably would never admit this out loud, but I want you to go inside and think and get honest. Because instead, you're just going to hurt yourself when you eat poorly, eat whatever you want. When you lack structure, because growing up was way too controlled and perfectionistic and OCD. You're going to lack calm in your life, and you're probably not going to get things accomplished in the ways that you want to. You know, we may deny this at first, but if we sit with it long enough, and sit with this logic, we can begin to see that it's anything but loving when we act out. We suffer without discipline, ironically. Loved ones suffer around us when they have to deal with our health issues, when we're running around because we can't find our keys because we refuse to put them in the same place every night. Self-love means self-discipline. It means making time for ourselves. It means not doing things to hurt ourselves. It means allowing for things to be different and better for us. You can do self-harm in lots of different ways. You cannot get enough rest because you're running around doing too much. You cannot honor your soul's purpose because you won't go out and do work that you love because you're afraid. It means not making time for you, not making time for any kind of self-care, and not taking care of your life, not getting things done, not being trustworthy in terms of functional trust, like following through on stuff. So here are some questions to ask yourself about maybe where you are today in terms of working on your self-discipline. Remember, everything is a continuum. And as we do here, just trust what comes up for you. Okay, you ready? So it's five years from now. And in five years, if you don't make changes, what will be your reality? I want you to think about that for a minute. What are you like? What does your life look and feel like? What will be going on? And you can take some data into account, like for your health, for example. What does the doctor said? If you don't take care of this, X might happen. What do you already know or safely assume? With that thought, what do you want to have gotten rid of by then or gained in your life? So maybe you want to get rid of all the clutter in your house, the stressful people in your life. Maybe you'd like some healthier friends, a different place to live, better physical health, less stress. How do you want to feel about yourself as a person? What adjectives? Would you want to describe your life five years from now? And finally, what's going to be so great if you follow through on what you say you want to change today and or begin to change today? What's going to be awesome? So today we focused on an important aspect of self-love, which is self-discipline. Loving ourselves enough to say no to what isn't working in our life and saying no to hurting our health, draining our energy, and maybe sabotaging good things for ourselves. Learning to practice boundaries and following through even on one change can be empowering and life-changing. Change takes courage. It takes the when, the why, and the how. Thank you so much for joining me today. May you stay grounded and be proud of your self-discipline so far. Focus on the good in yourself and find some good out there in the world and be some good out there in the world. We need it. Be sure to check the show notes at ownitpowercast.com. And sign up for the newsletter each Tuesday. That's where you get the bonus downloads from the episodes. All right, so pay it forward. 
keep focusing on you, and I'll see you next time. We hope you took away some useful insights and tools you can begin using right away. If you did, please leave a positive review and share on your social media. Because could you imagine if everyone in your life really got it together? Remember, own it now, so you can really own it later. <laughs>